Demons of the Punjab and Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror are two fascinating historical stories in Chris Chibnall's era of Doctor Who that were not written or co-written by Chibnall himself, but instead they were written by interesting first-time writers for the show, Vinay Patel for Demons and Nina Mativia for Tesla. The audio commentaries for both these episodes, both of which feature those writers, reveal all sorts of interesting insights and build off topics and themes we've looked at in our first two Chibnall era commentary explorations. Our first themed around finality and actor and audience relationships with the show, covering the three specials that entered the era. And our second commentary exploration covering Spyfall Part 2 and themed around controversy and writing inspiration. And this Tesla Demons commentary exploration will be looking particularly at authenticity, historicals, and personal history. We'll unpack what the commentators have to say, discuss it ourselves, and tie it into larger conversations around the era and the show in general, looking at lots of interesting stuff along the way. I'm joined by my English friends Ingiga and Oliver to explore these two commentaries today. First, we'll look at Tesla. This commentary has writer Nina Mativier, Mandip Gill Al Yaz, and Anjali Mohindra as the Scorpion Queen of the Scythra. Let's dive right in. Yeah, I was really excited to get to write an episode about Nikola Tesla because he's just such a sort of, the more I researched into him, he's just such a larger than life figure, like even from 100 years ago, he's this sort of brilliant inventor, like misunderstood, romantic with a capital R figure. And, and also, I didn't know too much about him. It's one of those people that you've heard of. So if there's ever a quiz, you can shout out the answer. But you're like, actually, I didn't know too much about what he invented or the story yeah. behind him. Yeah, you sort of know, like, the car and, yeah. like... Never seen Even though there was a real person behind the name Tesla. Mm. So it's, yeah, great to learn about him more. Small note of despair that Elon Musk has somehow usurped <laughs> the brand of, of Tesla to the point where people know more about the company than he the person. Yeah, we have the nice note of the writers clearly passionate and interested in the figure and then similar to Spyfall 2 we have the general not knowing much about the figure from other people in the commentary and the big tech thing of knowing the figure well it's not even with Ada they knew of Ada from like the big tech Lovelace rooms but here they didn't even know Tesla was a guy just that Tesla is a word yeah that's really interesting I I'm probably just too online but to me it's it's been a cliche for years that Tesla's actually the good inventor. Yeah. You know, that that's a thing going back decades. And so it's really interesting that that's not actually general knowledge, that, that he's not known as a historic underdog outside of those circles. I think when you look at this approach to a celebrity historical where the writer's actually really engaged and interested by the person in, in question they're writing an episode about that person like it, it compares it compares very favorably to something like you know spyfall 2 which is just kind of like scooping up whatever women you can get his hands on and they end up being just sort of adrift in i guess a mess of screen pages yeah adrift <laughs> yeah, dr yeah. <laughs> reference unintended Lis <laughs> listening to these two commentaries in a row because on, on the blu-ray that's how it is episode two then episode four it's really interesting because there's so many shared ideas in the episodes and in the commentaries so the differences between uh chris Jimno's approach and nina's approach here are really interesting and also because the episodes are so close together as well there's just ed himes episode in the middle separating them for them to treat some ideas the same, but to treat some ideas differently is so interesting to me because Chibnall's still the showrunner. You know, this is his script that he has his own kind of authorship either as well, even though he's not the writer of it. The incongruent aspects between them really fascinate me for that reason. I guess when you have that, I guess maybe a material the word Oliver likes to use. I get uh, that sort of presence at, at the top of the show. I guess a lack of overall unifying vision. You just get everyone off doing their own things, really. Like I guess a lack of I guess the 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 role that the tone meeting would I suppose play in like in maybe traditional New Who. I get the sense from Russell T Davies's era that some writers might have even disliked how firm a hold he had on his seasons, how much he would rewrite a lot of other writers' episodes to like a very authorial degree where he could have you know justifiably claimed a lot more credit than he did and his seasons often will have such a unity because he's enforcing his vision for the season so firmly over all the other, other scripts particularly series one i think uh is really obviously rtd's series uh so it's interesting with chibnall i 
don't get that sense so much because I notice a lot of little thematic incongruent aspects between his episodes and other writers' episodes sometimes. This will get very interesting in Rosa when it's a co-authorship. But with Tesla, I find the differences interesting, yeah. So now you mentioned co-authorship. A lot of Series 12 episodes were Chibnall co-credits, weren't they? Like, it was actually... I think... Te- mm. te- was Tesla one? Tesla wasn't, right? Tesla's solo credit to Nina. Yeah, yeah. So Tesla's one of the few though that wasn't a Chibnall co-credit. So I guess when you get to that point where Chibnall is actually co-writing a lot of the episodes, is I guess maybe the in- incongruence is maybe even harder to justify, I don't know. But yeah, so yeah, I like this episode and I think the writer comes off uh, really quite well in this commentary. She's she's very passionate about Tesla. Yeah, I I, I think it's a good I think it's a good episode. Yep. I agree. Um but at risk of just repeating um what I've written about the episode elsewhere, I think it's really interesting that the the way this uh, this first sort of proper celebrity historical that's about a famous creative um, in the way that all the celebrity historicals are. The way that this is made to confront the fact that um, history recognises the wrong people a lot of the time and it puts credit on individuals when a lot of things aren't individuals and the way it's, again, it's writing a historical injustice um, but here it's forced to confront the great man thing regarding Edison um but ends up not taking apart the structural issue of how we look at history and it and just sort of shifts the the emphasis from one historical great man to another one. It, it sort of stumbles at the finish line, I feel. Again, I, I like it a lot, but it doesn't quite, I think, bring the structural change. Maybe because it's a return to the form of the celebrity historicals, it's inevitably going to be that kind of story. Versus the thing I I think slightly more interesting version of historical stories we get in the Capaldi era. Yeah, I th- it's interesting when the historicals try to reckon with the largeness of the figures, and if they do stumble and constrain back down at the end, I think it's still more interesting than the theme park historicals we sometimes get. I think of Churchill and Victory of the Daleks, and I don't really think that I f- I feel very much like it's a theme park kind of insertion of the figure, and that it's not really reckoning with him. It's it's not even necessarily a, like a s- 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 how to put this. It's just like he's in there as a, a tourist attraction, a museum artifact, a, a yeah, heritage <laughs> museum kind of thing. Yeah, like a mascot. Yeah. <laughs> so this is based on when I was researching the episode. Even though Tesla was quite a kind of loner, he believed that to be an inventor, you had to kind of be alone and that was how you had ideas but he had to do these big kind of performances as well so he was also the showman because he needed people to invest in his tech and wasn't super successful as we kind of see (laughs) too honest yeah was there something about mars i read recently yeah so the mars signal is real in that yeah he uh found he was doing a lot of experiments with kind of um electricity and signaling and he found this kind of he described it as a feeble electrical signal and he calculated it came from mars and there was a headline about it in the papers at the time and it led to a lot of people sort of thinking he was a bit nuts a bit off the wall um but yeah as soon as i read that i was like you can't write a doc two episode about nikola tesla and not include the fact he got a message from mars so i'm not gonna lie I thought that bit was sort of like made up for the sci-fi value. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely meant it was real. Crazy. Yeah, I would have thought I would have like that's a bit crazy. Did that really happen? Now yeah. I'm like, wow. Yeah, it's amazing. And he, I think. What? I imagine, anyway, fairly unusually for the time, he was, I think the way a lot of people think now, probably the size of the universe, extraterrestrial life might exist, yeah. and Tesla really believed that too, but at the time that made him quite a sort of outside figure to think thoughts like that. Kind of a similarity with some of the other historicals commentaries in that there was a Doctor who thing going on in this person's life, so I thought that will work for Doctor Who stuff. But I also like the engagement with his personality and like contradictions within that personality, like that he was a loner, but he had to be a showman. So I'm interested in the tension between that. Uh, I like that stuff. I think it's an interesting contrast in terms of um, what kind of things in a historical figure's life make them like Doctor who Like, so for example, um, with other people you might get, oh, he had amnesia or there was a, a time we can't account for. Whereas in the case of Tesla, it's actual concepts are related to sci-fi Doctor Who, I guess, messages from other planets, extraterrestrial life. So I guess it's just like, in some cases, 
there's like the the way to insert you know aliens and the TARDIS and such is more direct and more obvious and less um I guess less touchy maybe like it, it, there's less kind of it, it's safer ground it's more obvious ground it's more maybe more fertile I don't know yeah uh invaders from Mars is another one where it's like it's really easy to put Doctor Who in here because it's already engaging with Doctor Who ideas yeah that's an interesting point with some historicals versus something like Rosa which I mean, that sort of <laughs> the tension of Rosa is the fact that Doctor Who's getting in the way of real and serious history. Um, yeah, here it fits naturally. And part of that, um, I think is the, the sort of pop cultureification of Tesla. We're used to seeing Tesla in sci-fi stuff. Mm. The name is associated with sci-fi stuff already. Um, but also I think, I think the writing holds it together and conceptually. It all aligns quite neatly. And having a monster who represents a thematic yes, yes. element to the story, that's just nice. That's a good thing to have. It's odd there hasn't been so much of it, but having monsters who scavenge and steal stuff, neat. Yeah, we'll, we'll get this with demons as our next episode too. It's, to, it, it's so refreshing in this era where it's like the Doctor who thing links in completely with all the other stuff in the story it's not like a disparate oh we have to have the monster here to to make it work as a doctor who story it's the monster actually relates to the story of the characters uh is it damning with faint faint praise i honestly don't know (laughs) this era but it's nice it's good it's nice when the writer remembers what metaphor and symbolism are (laughs) yeah and it's only this series that we've started getting dressed into costumes appropriate for the period. Oh, okay. Last year we stayed in our own mm. outfits. How have you found that? Oh, I pref- like when I signed up, I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to dress up all the time. So this is right up my street. Oh. Just getting to try loads of new things, loads of new costumes, loads of new periods, having to do research um, about that particular period and they like re-explain certain stuff. Second act, things, series 12, whole new series. Now we get to wear different clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm glad they get to. It's a bit of fun, isn't it? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's great. I do genuinely love it, but it's just that pitiful thing we sometimes get with Yaz in particular, where it's like, I hate that this is the big thing. <laughs> I hate that you getting to wear like a period dress with cool pockets is like such a huge move. Like in Rose's third episode, she was doing that. Yeah. It's, I, I not, fond of their characters as I am. I, I'm really, I really enjoy um, Mandip and Jody. Their energy for the for the roles and for the... And I, I appreciate, to a degree, especially with what's come out about Thasmin, um, I appreciate that the creative team are um, bending to what they enjoy. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if all the Survivors of the Flux stuff was at least in part because Mandip loved dressing up in period costumes. I, I appreciate that relationship. Um, so it's a shame they don't get more of it. Huh? I think this links back to our Spyfall 2 thing, uh, Oliver, when we were talking about mm. it's such a shame the story is let down because it brings up so many good concepts. There's such potential in the story that it's a shame it doesn't work. With Mandip's performances, Yaz, I really like Mandip. I think she has a real spark. To her performance and i think she, when she gets meatier material to play i think she always rises to it and does it interestingly that's why the issues with how little yes has been written or how thin the stuff for her has been written or how pitiful some of it has been it rankles me more than like with ryan and tozen because i really like what mandip's doing and i feel like there's stuff there so <laughs> for the big step to be you know um what, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 episodes in, I get the cool period dress. It's It hurts me even more than it would with other characters. I sort of wish... Um, and I, I don't think this is unique to this era. I think um, that sort of... But we, we, we were talking before about how it's not always that interesting to have actors on commentaries. But I remember uh, David Tennant's commentaries always being fairly interesting because of how involved he is with the story. Yeah. Um, because of how he would take stuff back to RTD and be like, oh, I'm not sure I see the character doing this or whatever. Um, it, it, having that, that interconnectedness, that cohesiveness between elements of production, um, it's really strong when it comes through and it's really nice to hear about. And I think it's a shame that, yeah. um, that, that this is so little and 
so late. I I like cast commentaries when the cast members talk about their performances and their characters and stuff. It's just that so many I've heard in my life are just like endless anecdotes about getting up in the morning to go film or, you know, <laughs> the, the drive to the filming site or, you know, some little mild thing that happens on filming, which is totally understandable stuff you talk about at work and with your coworkers. But there's like a point where I wasn't there. I really don't care what food <laughs> you had between takes. Um, but M- Mandip gets excited about stuff, which is nice on the commentaries, yeah. Is there any room to mix stuff up or because it's a historical figure that if there's any inaccuracies, it's a, it's a big deal? Um, I tried to be... I mean, obviously, this Skithra. We don't know. He's it's got a signal from Mars. <laughs> but when talking about his work, his relationship with Edison, sort of the, the place he was at in his life when this episode is set. So it's set in 1903, which um, is kind of for two reasons. So one was it was when his boy in Cliff Tower, which is appearing later when the episode was built. So I thought that's just a great way to kind of show off the scope of his ambition and like the scale of his ideas. But it's also at the point when it's about to be torn down, like Edison's smear campaign has kind of worked against him. So I think even though you can see how big his ideas were and what a genius he was, you also see how out of place he is and how he's kind of losing hope. So that was why I went for this year and I tried to make everything surrounding that as historically accurate as possible, excepting this guitar, obviously, for a bit of a leap of imagination. I love how specific she is with the time she set this in. I like that she's really thought about different periods of Tesla's life and really identified this would make the most sense to insert, you know, some rich Doctor Who storytelling into. I I really liked hearing her thinking there. I like that she phrases it in terms of what the setting and the choice of year and stuff reveals about his character. And just because obviously with uh, with a Doctor Who episode and stuff, you're using you've got to use broad strokes, I guess, to try and clue us into what you're saying about this figure and kind of what they're like because obviously you can't get into every last little finicky little detail but so it's like i think it shows intelligence on the part of the writer to just be thinking in terms of how do how do you convey meaning with your choice of like time period and stuff and even just like the the use of his tower like that that, that she mentioned and the way in which that symbolizes his ambition i guess in its own way obviously that's a thing from real life but like the the use of it in the episode and i think it's used very well in this episode by the way i love that the episode transitions through settings as it builds like in the way that like you expect a well-constructed episode of television to do it felt very rare in this era but like i mean it's all working together and it's all functioning very well there's this there's this conception of writing this is a bit of a tangent. There's this conception of writing as making stuff up, right? And it is. It's not a serious profession. But you're making stuff up. But all writing is, to a greater or lesser degree, adaptation of something, of cliches, of actual other texts, of real-life experience, whatever. You're adapting something. And so I think that makes historical episodes of this show a particularly interesting ground for seeing how a writer works because you can see where the ideas came from directly right um and the way that the ideas in tesla are adapted from real life to fit a more structured narrative to fit the sci-fi elements to make thematic meaning um you can see the cogs working you can see how all the ideas have clicked together from where they originally came from in a way that is often a little bit opaque um with writing in general, and especially um, this era, uh, I think it's really interesting to see where she's getting those ideas from and yeah. how they slot together and the thought that's gone into making sure they work as a whole. I think we get a lot of sense of her intent here, where yeah. I felt a little unmoored with Chibnall in the Spyfall 2 commentary sometime, why he was making certain decisions. But here, I like it's very, it's all about the story, but you can see how her mind has arrived at the story decisions she's making. It's not like I did a computer thing, so I put in Ada Lovelace and then she had to get her mind What It's like it's, he's, she's really thought through um, Tesla to do the Doctor Who story. I, I really like that. Uh, so the next, it's two clips, but there's no gap between them, but they make more sense together. So it's, it's like two together now. Let's go. Ooh, I like this as well, because we often go away from the Doctor. And usually, you're either with the Doctor or you're with Ryan or Graham, whereas this time, I get to go off with someone else, so I get to, I got, like, lots of scenes with Goran. Um, 
I felt like I could hold my own now after like a series and a half. She trusts Yaz mm. to go off with some like it would not ordinarily have been the Doctor and um, Tessa that went off together. Yeah, I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she trusts me. <laughs> I think you guys had a really nice energy together. Yeah, yeah. I think I just I got on with Goran as well and talked to him a lot. So when it comes to in these scenes, as much as you're in character, you've also created a natural connection where you. Mm. I, I am. I was sort of intrigued by him yeah. and his life and his career which I think transpires into me being excited to talk to Tesla yeah. and being left alone as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in charge. Yeah. <laughs> I think your scenes together are really, lo- yeah. like, really lovely. Like, Because I thought, oh, yeah, it's, you know, like she's used to travelling with the Doctor, who's this brilliant, slightly outsider character, so she's not going to be intimidated. Yeah. But like when they had that scene together and they're doing science later, yeah. I was like, you're not just going to stand back and let them crack on with it. You're going to be like, hands on, let's get involved. Corin's <laughs> fab. Yeah, he is. He's great. He's really good. It's a lot of things went right this episode. It's not just the script. It's getting lucky with your guest actors, which you don't always do, even with good scripts. And giving Yaz something to do. Uh, hearing Mandip say, yeah, after a series and a half, it just, it kills me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's so upsetting, right? Yeah. But usually the companions save the day or lead the story in the first episode, and if not the first one, the second one. At a extreme push. The classic thing is that in the first episode you showcase the Doctor, in the second episode the companion makes some big decision that swings the story um, and establishes themselves as a power. That That's the classic thing with, you know, your beast blows and your end of the worlds and whatnot. Yeah. The series and a half! It's just absurd. It makes me so sad. The Yaz and Mend. The fact that even just a scene where she's not attached to the Doctor or Ryan and Graham is like some revelation for Yaz. It's, oh, oh, it's just, just crazy. <laughs> this isn't even her driving the story. It's not her saving the day or commanding the narrative or it being about her. This is just having some room to breathe. Yeah. This is just being left to do her own thing after a series and a half. You would really hope that um, Yaz and, by extension, Mandip would have had more time in the spotlight before now. Or radar. Radar? Using energy waves to work out what's around you. Whoops. It's just a theory. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know sometimes when you have lines. Like, obviously, we know about... I know what I'm saying, but I can't give it away to him. Sometimes there's, like, a fine line between how you play it. Like, you know, you're being your character and you would just naturally say it, but then you have to be aware of, like, Tesla. Like, how do you know that? Mm, Yeah. So he's always playing that little look for the audience, like, oops, (laughs) a bit too much. That's such a lovely comparison to the Lovelace stuff, because it doesn't really matter. It's a bit cheeky. Um, but it, it doesn't matter that she might be giving something away because th- Tesla's not a, a character defined by fragile historical precision. Yeah. His character's big enough to um, to be important regardless of whether this precise idea was inspired by real events or fictional ones. I think it's a tonal control thing too. Like, like Mand was saying how she plays the line, you can kind of play some of these things like a joke, like in the Shakespeare code, whatever we think of it. So many of the scenes of the Doctor talking to Shakespeare, it's like played jokingly. We're not like actually saying Shakespeare is discredited by, you know, the do- Doctor doing whatever. It's like there's there's a sense of breeziness to the scene. I think here as well, it's not like played with the drama and the import of, oh, yes, has inspired this incredible, you know, thought in Tesla. This is, this is his life's work now that he's discovered radar from this woman from the future. It's played as a little like, quick little move it's just this little beat it's not a big deal and yet only two weeks before this aired we had all that drama of having to humiliate and mind wipe ada lovelace for the vague thoughts of computers swirling around her it's just a remarkable difference there's no sort of reverent whispers of modern prometheus or whatever yeah Right, it's it's a bit of fun. It doesn't super matter. In the future, Tesla, you will inspire Elon Musk, and but until then, I must wipe your memory. <laughs> you, you'll have a Mars colony named after you. <laughs> well, they should have done that. They should have taken the fan to the Mars colony, so they can look out through the doors and nod. <laughs> wow, that is that's one of the the grimmest things about this episode is the way that it's. Like I mentioned, it's struggling with that um, 
single individual male inventor who defined history tension. Um, and it's sort of pushing back against the idea that Edison is that, but in doing so, it's replacing it with the notion that Tesla should have been the great man of history instead of Edison, which ends up being a little bit... It has the actual line, doesn't it? Like, he should have been a billionaire by now or something like that. Yeah, he should have been the first billionaire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which lined up against the thing about how um, look, New York at its height, there's more poor people than ever. <laughs> ever before, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did it, guys. It, it, it's hard not to read this episode in the in light of Elon Musk. I, I called my essay on this one um, Elon Musk's Night of Terror, but terror like Earth. Yeah, it's it's frustrating that I think Nina does a good job writing the human uh, Tesla and there's a lot of nice touches to how she does it, but I still feel constrained within, I don't know if this is from her specifically uh, or Chibnall or how it came about or, you know, the brief, sh- I don't know where it eventually, where it came from, but this big tech conception of tesla like his worth is that he could have made so much money or you know he inspired all these cool doohickeys we have today it's it feels kind of demeaning it's offset by the warm touch the episode generally portrays him with but it is uncomfortable the big tech thinking of him the 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 big tech valuing of him yeah absolutely because that's he is defined in this not by the way he improved um you know quality of life or revolutionise the the way humanity lived, but by reference to all the doohickeys, all the things, the gadgets, the uh, the little bits of capital we all have that only make us miserable, the depression rectangles we keep in our pockets. You know, it's it's not it's not finding some great meaning in his inventive spirit, um, because it, his his thing was um, free, free everything. He was uh, not without his flaws, obviously, and I don't know that much about Tesla, but he was a socially minded, let's make electricity free for everyone, right? Yeah. It comes to me that it's mostly in the Doctor and the other companions characterization of him that this kind of big tech thing comes out like, Graham, oh, of course I know about him, or, you know, he made this, he made that, he could have been a billionaire. But Tesla himself is written in the nicer way, I think, which is just an inter- interesting touch. It's almost, it's almost like the modern characters are c- the cynical ones uh, and Nina lets Tesla just kind of be himself more. Although at the end, we do start moving into the framing uh, thing all of us talked about, yeah. I guess a few points like that and point, a point of view on Tesla like that, it, it's just stuff that's inher- the show kind of inherits from the assumptions of, like, I guess, <laughs> British centrist culture, I suppose. Just those unquestioned assumptions about, like, yeah, big tech, good, yeah, billionaires, that's that's the way of things. And, and you can see that in other places in Chip Who as well. And, and of course, in Moffat Who and RTD Who as well. Yeah. Like, it's just a thing. For me, it's really intriguing to know what you made up, what was written in the script, or what a director said. You know, like, if I watch a, anything, or these, I, like, for instance, Brad and, and Tosin, some of their lines are really funny, or they're little actions that they do i always go who did that yeah who put that bit in was that them i just thought that was super relatable <laughs> because we talk about that kind of thing all the time so it was nice to hear Manda talk about it as well it's like um is is tosin's praxius shadow puppet is that in the script the shadow puppet that's actually arachnids isn't it i, I think or am i mixing it up oh arachnids yeah yeah, yeah, yeah i, I forgive true. you for confusing them like those episodes you tend to blur into each other it's in a lab with animals yeah who've gone mad because of pollution yeah just a nice cute man comment i thought i share her obsession there i was so close it was really people were sad friends. scene to write because what I can in the story tesla's kind of grieving for like you know the world's not going to be able to see what i can do and Obviously, like him and the Doctor save the day, and go. the alien is defeated. Take but me. that's not. You know that in real life he didn't get to complete that's this project. Right. The money never came through. It got torn down. So, no. even though I wanted to write something that was sort of like no. hopeful, and he's sort of inspired by meeting the Doctor, like you're going to change the world. It was, yeah. It's it's sad it. to think in real life he didn't get to now, see this one project that that through. And, yeah. And, yeah. That tension's sort of at the heart of all these historical stories. That that question of um, their sort of heroic saving the day in the episode and their historic, um, usually limited success, right? 
those things are always in conflict and tension with each other in these kinds of episodes. Um, and it's nice to see it handed, you know, a proper amount of weight and, I guess, deafness um, in making sure that the tone feels right. You know, Tesla does save the day and it's all historic um, and he doesn't manage to change the world in any way that he gets recognised for, but then also that's okay because recognition wasn't what he wanted, you know. It, it's not massively complicated stuff, but it's it's a well-balanced story. It's a story. Yeah, it's interesting to compare to the Norse stuff. I was really fascinated that Nina kind of talked about restraint there. Like, I wanted to give him this, but I thought better to do this. I thought that was interesting. I think that the sense of priorities in terms of like, acknowledging that this character kind of this this person from history kind of went through kind of sucky things in their life but inserting the doctor to i guess like encourage them uh, just try and make them feel better about it like just imagine a character a fictional character going to this person saying like it's not so bad and you know let me tell you something that might make you feel better with like the, the kind of disappointing outcome of your life um it, it, it's i think the fact that it's kind of small and personal and like directed towards i guess to, about tesla about him compared to the nor thing about how our oh, fascists never win mm -hmm. yeah i guess that makes it feel more sincere in a way the fact that it's more personal yeah i think the stuff that feels more appropriate to do that kind of fantasy escapist what if we could go back and tell this person this thing like the holocaust is not the best place for that perhaps but like a much smaller it's not so bad, you know, um, your inventions, blah, blah, blah. It feels less weird tonally to me. Yeah, I think um, sort of the basic motive of celebrity historicals in particular is trying to find justice or trying to imagine some form of justice in a historical setting that doesn't have any. Um, and so it, I, I guess it's just catharsis, really, but... I, I do enjoy that these stories are about going back and making something that wasn't okay a little bit better, just adding to a pile of good things, right? Yeah. I guess it's also the recognition of what happened. Like, we're, we're looking, we're touching on what went wrong with Tesla, like there. With the Nor thing, when you take out the execution and just kind of leave it as the fascists don't win, it, it's again, it's that invalidating thing of you're framing things in a ahistorical way weird way at that point like if you recognize the sadness and then you like give a little saving throw like in Vincent and the Doctor or in here that's one thing but to just not show this sadness at all happening uh, feels very different to me have you ever seen a dead planet I've seen more than you can possibly imagine the music has changed mm. I think I can be by this when I was writing voice. this one Chris was telling me about his his plan for Spyfall 1 and 2 mm -hmm. so yeah. I thought oh I'll put in a reference to that because yeah. it's such a big moment in yeah, the series yeah. isn't it when yes. Gallifrey is destroyed or I like a reference like we've not completely forgotten about it because I know they're standalone episodes but that thing would still affect her yeah so I, I personally like it when they go when it hits like that just hit her then for a yeah. second <laughs> I like that we've not yeah. completely forgotten about it. <laughs> that made me laugh. <sighs> uh, don't you love when the things that happen to a character are relevant to that character? It's yeah, it's it's like we talk I know we talk about how um the Chibnall era often has us you know come to the conclusions of really basic foundational storytelling things. <laughs> yeah. It's like we've arrived at serialized TV <laughs> here. It's great that a thing in an earlier episode was remembered yeah and i really like that moment um i think that's genuinely pretty good but again it's just it's it's not more than what you expect it's yeah the character recognizing where they are emotionally and that being relevant to the story that's being told currently that you that, that's foundational i think it was interesting a lot of the times we assume in scripts, if there's like an arc mentioned, the showrunner must have added it in, which I'm sure a lot of the time is what happens. But it's interesting here, that was Nina's idea to add in because she knew of 
Chibnall's plans for Spy 4, 1 and 2 from talking to him, but she decided to add the arc linking thing, which I thought was quite interesting. On the subject of that, that scene, Have You Seen a Dead Planet, and it being an arc thing, I mean, it, I mean it's, it's worth noting that if that question had been asked to the Doctor like at any previous point in Doctor Who, like it would have gone probably the same way because I mean, not just because of the fact that Gallifrey had been itself destroyed before but also just like just as a general case like of course the Doctor's seen loads of dead planets and shit like it's I mean last episode y- y- yeah yeah or 55 of course so it's like have you seen a dead planet yes it was the second story of the show yeah I, I, yeah <laughs> Yes, but I, I guess it's just like it comes to. Uh, it's nice of sort of the writer to kind of like insert, obviously like a thing, a reference to last week or whatever, two weeks ago. But at the same time, I guess it just reflects like maybe the the the, the degree to which the stuff being referenced here from the arc is maybe not not all that provocative or um, revealing in and of itself because we don't get anything from the Doctor really here that we wouldn't necessarily get like elsewhere other than maybe like a, a split second of Jody looking a bit like rattled I don't know and I think that's a really interesting instinct that instinct to make it part of the narrative and have it be driving characters and shifting the plot um and you you get some of that in something like Fugitive where it totally takes over um but you don't have that sense in a series like Series 9, every story is somehow connected to or motivated by what's going on between the characters and what's going on across the series. You know, standalone stories like The Girl Who Died aren't standalone at all. Um, but here, there's just that sort of obligatory connective tissue. I think it's a good instinct to have, like, for a writer, like, even if they're writing a standalone episode, like, for them to want it to be woven into the wider series, even if that's being written by the showrunner and the showrunner hasn't figured it out or whatever. Like, I think, I think it, it shows a desire on the part of the author to try and be part of something larger and have their episode matter in a way and just be woven in and linked in rather than just be floating off in its own bubble. Because the logic is that uh, any story you're writing is happening surrounded by other experiences in these characters' lives. You know, you can't really write anything standalone. Um, in TV, every event that's happening to a character is preceded by other events, and it's connected to other events around it. So to understand where those characters are at, you need to have connective tissue. Um, you can't, or at least you shouldn't be able to, just take any story from any series and plonk it into any other because characters should be leading in these instances but it's nice that we have this one line in this case one of my favorite episodes this Mm. yeah you take good care of yourself you too thank you (laughs) it's just it just it teaches you so much there's a story there's the 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 sci-fi element with a skithra but you learn something and they're real characters that like like, I feel like I've been taught something and I, I, I understand something that no matter how much research I could have done, I've sort of, like, seen it in a world that it, it sort of, like, fits. Sci-fi and yeah. his yeah. vision fits. Totally. Nothing's changed. A few I, I learned so much, like, researching it and... His, like Goran's final line in this episode is sort of inspired by an actual quote of Tesla's, which I, I really loved his philosophy, but it sort of made me feel better writing this episode because you know when the Doctor and the gang sort of fly away, he's going back to his work and he's not going to have that much success. But yeah. I feel like in the present day, more and more, we're understanding the impact of his work and he was someone who was so much about progress and yeah. the future that it's nice it to sense think that he was that still would, progressing. Yeah. yeah, that would really mean something to him. Yeah. Of your own. When, in the Spyfall 2 commentary discussion, when Gig was talking about how the fullness of an episode is its own kind of shape, that Aristotelian thing he was talking about, that was the man to quote I was thinking of when she's talking about how seeing something as an episode of TV uh, imparts a certain type of understanding that at least she wouldn't get from other sources. So that's interesting. Yeah, it's like a story conveys experience in a way that, uh, just, you know, a list of facts maybe doesn't, like... Yeah, it's exactly what we were saying, um, that a story is a thing, it is a unit of meaning, uh, and this is a successful one, it imparts both historical information yeah. and emotional, thematic meaning. Um, we should get Mandip on the podcast. <laughs> 
<laughs> we should, we're really clicking in uh, with her, yeah. Uh, I think there's a responsibility with, because I think Mandip's right and Gig's right, that we're all right, <laughs> that uh, TV <laughs> episodes are so effective in lodging into your head like that because of how they work. It's, it's not just... It's even different from a novel in some ways because it's such an overwhelming aesthetic experience. The visuals, the music, everything is beaming the story very powerfully, I think, into your brain, which means like when Chibnall talks about, and it's okay because they'll get the real story, the full story when they go Google it. I'm like, well, they can, but you've beamed a really powerful message. Like if we're thinking of this episode, like a message from space being beamed into someone, it, this is what, like what TV is doing, I think, because it's such a memorable narrative. It, it's so aesthetically powerful how stories are told on TV that I think you can't really, I don't think it's responsible to fob off. Well, then they'll go learn the facts on Wikipedia or whatever. I'm not saying that's necessarily exactly what Chibnall was saying, but I think there is a real responsibility, especially when a writer specifically recognises the importance and the power of TV storytelling. So I guess it's a pretty happy ending here because I think the story generally did a good job of realising the period and Tesla from what I know. Uh, but it's a big thing to do a historical episode, I guess, particularly when it's not being portrayed in a super comedic way because then people are kind of primed to think, well, I get that the aliens aren't real, but I assume the general ideas here all are. It's a big assumption and it's one that Doctor Who can kind of coast on, which is a big deal, I think. I think if you make someone sit in front of a TV screen for 45 to 60 minutes, like having assuming that they would then also be bothered to do further research, I think is a, is a bit generous. Yes. <laughs> like that, That's the thing. Like You made them sit there like you should you should be prepared for them to just accept that as a whole thing, as a completed thing. I don't think this is actually Chibnall's mindset, but I think for some writers, it's almost like a conscience assuring thing that, oh, it's okay if I villainize this person who's actually fine in real history because I'm doing a story. They can go learn the real thing. It's not my fault. You know, they can go read a book. You know, I'm just a TV writer. I'm just a script writer, man. I think for some writers, there might be that kind of aspect of it. But yeah, it's the... The TV is going to stick in their brains. Even if someone goes and reads an article that is more true to history, are they going to remember it? Are they going to remember their eyes scanning words on a page, you know, with no images? Or are they going to remember a great actor bringing someone to life? And maybe their words aren't really synced in to what the person felt in real history, but they're probably going to remember that more. I would say, for a lot of cases, then they're going to remember an article. I mean, it's the whole idea behind both advertising and propaganda. Like, you know, the way you depict things and represent things and the messaging you put out there, you know, it, it, all, it all matters. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, even, like, so if, 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 even if someone can go and look at another source, like, they won't necessarily do so. That's why people want to spam their messaging as much as possible and get people to see their side of things. Yeah. Yeah, no, what, across, this, um, across this commentary, what it feels like Mandip's outlining is Again, quite a fundamental idea, but the the idea that all the aspects of a story of TV in this case are elements of a whole, from the costuming she talks about to the to the monsters, to the meaning, to the history, to the way it connects into the um, the wider arc as a whole, that they're all just describing having a unit of story. It being a story where all the elements of the form of this story, all, all the textual and formal sort of um, aspects, come together to create one unit of meaning, and that's not—that's what storytelling is. That's what TV is. But it's interesting to hear that sketched out as something sort of exceptional and particularly interesting in this era. It's holistic in a way that most of Chibnall Who just isn't. Okay, demons. Of the Punjab, who have we got for this one? We've got Vinay Patel, the writer. We've got our first appearance in the order we're doing of producer Alex Mercer. We've got Mandip again, and we've got Shane Zaza, who is the actor for Prem, uh, like the main guest actor in the episode. So yeah, let's listen to the first one. The uh, Jarians, because then you were quite heavily involved well in the design and the yeah. Concept. So um, I looked a lot. Uh, different mythologies from the subcontinent and particular Hindu mythologies partly because that's my background and um, just yeah that the concept of those many eyes and those tusks um, I just remember reading lots of comic books about uh, Hindu myths the, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata when I was a kid and they had all these very vivid uh, demons 
Um, so we wanted to take elements of that design, but obviously give it um, a who twist. I did not know about that, that about the design of the the Jarians. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because I I didn't watching the episode. I didn't love that design. I think it's a little bit static. And um, but that's a whole new layer to it. That's that's lovely. There's yeah. There's a few things interesting there. I think one is that the writer, who's not the showrunner, of course, and he's not the kind of senior writer at least yet, that sometimes eras kind of manifest up, like Moffat in the RTD era. Uh, and yet he's got quite an active involvement, like he's involved with the designs, uh, which doesn't always happen. Like I, uh, Series 7, that happened, I think partially because Moffat was very busy uh, and not overseeing as much as he might normally. But I think that, so that's interesting here. I like that he has that involvement with the designs. There's that pre-existing knowledge that he has as well. Like he has a pre-existing, a pre-existing understanding of, a lot of the things he's writing about or the inspiration that's useful for aesthetic choices in the episode, which I think is really interesting. And it's interesting to compare some of the other historicals and their writers, whether they have that pre-existing knowledge or relationship uh, with, with the text, things in the text yet. And then the actual aesthetic choices themselves, like Oliver was saying, yeah, that's quite interesting. It's what happens when you get a story where it's intensely personal to the writer and actually yeah. directly concerns like them, their background, their history. And, that, and that's, I guess that's kind of rare in Doctor Who just because... Yeah. I just, just because the, the nature of the things that Doctor Who usually deals with, being the show that's mostly produced by, like, white Brits dealing with, like, you know, aliens and whatever, like, it's, it's rare to get a story that's actually personal in this way, and that's what makes it so nice. Yeah. Glancing at the structure of the episodes we're looking at, um, we're following a bit of a narrative arc here. We're reaching the high point of the actually brilliant demons, um, and then crashing swiftly down afterwards but all the elements of production here like we were talking about with tesla it comes back to central ideas the design um for the thajarians leans on mythology but it's also and obviously mythology is absolutely essential to the world of the story but also the concepts behind them lead into uh, misunderstanding and fundamentally you know observation and remembrance. But he mentioned they have lots of eyes, right? And of course, they're watchers. That's what they do. They're observing. Of course, yeah. Yeah. And the fact that they look, that their many eyes make them look immediately unknowable and alien and hostile. But of course, that turns over into being a sort of cerebral um, thematic thing. Oh, it's, it's a good story. Yeah, I very much agree that <laughs> demons being placed around the middle is intentional. Well, I intended it. If we were going in chronological order, this would be a very different conversation. And there's sometimes benefits to doing it like that. Like uh, how we did the Tragedy of Yaz uh, project, I thought that made sense to really thoroughly track, to, like to build up a cumulative understanding and closely track how specific ideas, uh, both from the production team, from Chibnall and everyone, and in the fandom evolved over time, like to get really specific with, with tracking that. But here were these... Uh, Chibnall era commentary ones. I think we're doing something broader and more thematic and encompassing in a different way. And I think you really track a, a sort of tell us a sort of an evolution of themes the way we're doing it, especially between Spyfall 2 and then Tesla and Demons Now and Rosa and Spyfall 1 next. Uh, those are the ones I think you can most feel a sequenced development of ideas the way we're doing it. Uh, so let's continue. I remember this is one of the first things I wanted to get into the script. One of the contexts of partition that sort of gets lost is um, how many men fought in World War II. Um, two and a half million Indian soldiers, the largest volunteer force in history. And you just never really see a lot of it. So, yeah, having this scene here meant a lot to me. I lost them in the haze. I, I think I'm going to rewatch Demons after this. <laughs> What really strikes me there are uh, there are two things. One is Vinay says, this really meant a lot to me, and he obviously means it. And the second is, so with the brief for the episode, Chimnall already wanted an episode in Series 11 about partition. That's how, you know, this was all entered into. Uh, he comes into it saying, I really wanted to get this in there. Uh, earlier with Spyfall 2... I, there was this kind of sense of Chibnall floundering around and then he discovering something and going, oh, well, we'll have to bend the story to include Nor now that I know about Nor. Uh, with Vinay, it's kind of the opposite. He's entering in going, well, I've got to get this in. You know, I already know about this. I already care about this. This has to go in the episode. So I think that's just interesting 
difference uh, in historical uh, writing here. Yeah, it's bending, it's building a story around the key, like important moments and ideas and like themes, I guess, versus just sort of, I guess, of just scrounging the story together from disparate uh, images. Yeah, and that forgotten fact that he talks about that it's the largest volunteer army in history um, is obviously the fact that it's forgotten is essential to the themes of remembrance, but also that that's sort of grimly ref- reflected in the fact that World War Two is pretty much the most remembered event in our history, and we've forgotten this essential part of it. That reflects that, and the remembrance of the traumatic remembrance of the events from the point of view of a soldier, it all... He has this idea that he wants to get in, but it's attached to everything around it. It's relevant and it's rich and it's connected to all the adjacent ideas Yeah, um, in a way that creates that holistic meaning. I, I would connect that to Mandip's last Tesla comment and what we said about that, about the power of storytelling. All the World War II storytelling we have projected at us in the West so much of the time, which, you know, accomplishes many specific things, uh... That, that, that kind of speaks to that power Mandip and Gig were talking about. And so for Vinay to enter into here, enter into his episode wanting to show a different thing that's not often shown in those types of stories we get beamed into us, is really cool. And I think it it's different. When Chibnall wanted to include Noor, he specifically said, I wish there were you know lots of movies about this. This is really amazing, this woman. Uh, I want people to remember and know about this person. So there's a kind of similar thing Vinay here is saying, I really care about this. I really want people to know about this. I find Demons a really memorable episode. I absolutely do remember a lot of the things he beamed into my brain uh, from it, including what he was just talking about there. So I think he really succeeded at that. Yeah. You can. What he's not doing here, uh, what Vinay doesn't do, is uh, put out the idea of partition or the idea of the volunteer army and go... Well, I hope people Google that. Yeah. <laughs> right. He, he lays out a story with a whole meaning. Um, you watch the episode and you understand emotionally the point he's getting across and the historical context is felt by, by focusing so precisely on this one, um, both real and also, you know, symbolic family, um, he tells a personal story and a whole societal story in a way that doesn't leave you needing to Google stuff, right? You get a whole story and you can go and do your own research. And some people, I mean, I did because I knew shamefully little about partition, but it is a whole story in its own right. And he's not asking people to go off and Google it in their own time to finish the job. I don't know if, if he's actively thinking of this or not, but I think he really understands the duty of telling these sort of stories that we've been talking about, these historical stories and their power, in that to make it really work, he makes it a real story with, you know, realised characters and emotions. That We're more likely to remember what he tells us through the story because he makes it a story. It's not just like a list of facts, like there was this person who did that, you know, I hope you remember that and Google them. It's, yeah, he, he makes a compelling drama out of it. Uh, and so it's so much more effective uh, for that. Absolutely, yeah. That, that, that's like underst- that's understanding that's understanding the storyteller duty in what he can communicate to us, and it's also doing a good job of it. I'd argue that he does understand that duty as well because that's sort of what story's about. It's about yeah uh, recognition and acknowledgement and remembrance, even if you're not able to change things. Um, from your perspective as a 21st century scriptwriter, y- y- you can acknowledge, and that's maybe the most he can do in this situation, but that's what the episode is an exercise in. I think it's worth noting that whereas the other episodes we've looked at and we're going to look at are kind of celebrity historicals, Demons is like, you know, an anti-celebrity historical. Yeah. The, the fact that these people aren't celebrities is like the, the whole theme. So I guess that makes it fundamentally kind of different, the approach that it takes towards like, and the kind of things it has to deal with. Because like, 
he creates kind of an, an amalgam of kind of fic- fictional characters, but who are based on the experiences of many different people, kind of rolled into one sort of uh, hypothetical kind of example. And that's just like that allows a lot of freedom in terms of how you how we can make stuff holistic, how we can convey meaning, yeah, without having to like worry about kind of some of the insane things Chibnall's kind of doing with like you know mind wiping and you know just that sort of thing. Like it's just, I think it's fundamentally like it's a less restrictive genre that he's working in that Vina is working in. It's a very effective narrative choice. Yeah, the the freedom he gets from having it not be real people lets him make it more authentic in a funny way because he he, he can manoeuvre the characters more in a way that serves the themes he's trying to convey. Yeah, absolutely. In comparison, it's frankly incredible that he doesn't feel the need to pack away the, the historical narrative into a mind wipe and sort of package it away and go, oh, don't worry, it doesn't interfere with history because the story of the 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 main characters and the shows and um, stepping into this historical narrative is already part of um Yaz's grand history right and so it's segmented off as a part of her history um because it's traumatic and because it's uh, something she doesn't like to talk about and so it's doing that job of neatly packaging it away and don't worry about the impact we've had on history here, but in a characterful way and in a thematic way and in a way that doesn't violate the agency of a uh, uh, famous historical woman. And it's it's reinforced even through the villains. You're also all about remembrance and witnessing. Uh, so it's, it works really well in the episode. Yeah, even the, um, the date of the episode, which is what the next clip is about, it all links into these remembering ideas. So even though it's not real people specifically uh it's so keyed into like an appropriate way to think about the the era yeah how amazing that this episode was aired on remembrance day but that was by coincidence yeah total fluke yeah Mm. i wouldn't say it was a total fluke but it (laughs) i think in the you know in the in the run-up to transmission we weren't quite sure what exact date we were going to um, film on, so there was a bit of shuffling of the order of the episodes yeah, right. um, to make that work. So the poppies were accidental. When yes. we wrecked it, you know, months earlier, we were like, oh my God, all these beautiful wildflowers, I hope they'll, they'll never be here. We'd, we pictured we'd, we'd come back and it would just be this scorched, barren land. <laughs> and it was just stunning, wasn't it? Yeah. I've not heard... Uh, that confirmation before that they did shuffle the episode order. Yep. Because it's always seemed extremely obvious to me um, from everything about the whole series that they drastically changed the episode order fairly late in the game. But that's really impressive. Well, one of the first things we heard Streven say was you don't even have to watch it in order. So maybe that should have been taken as a hint. (laughs) Yeah. I think it's great, like TV magic, to be able to get it to go on Remembrance Day. I think that's a really special thing producers can do uh yeah is things like that because it we're linking the actual logistics of the episode itself to the ideas of the episode itself like that's not easy so it's very impressive that they pulled that off i think and arachnids in the uk um (laughs) less good story but to link it with halloween you know also was was a nice thing i love that the flowers were apparently a coincidence (laughs) i didn't know that yeah, it's funny, like, the producer is saying um, he succeeded in, in the linkage with Remembrance Day, and then he, they just got lucky uh, with the poppies. I mean, it's, that's one of the things that makes TV so interesting, is that liveness and the fact that it's broadcast, uh, less so these days, but at least conceptually to everyone at the same time at a specific point. And obviously, you know, how exactly that works is a bit in the air, but um, the fact that you can... You, you can create meaning not just through the text itself, but through the positioning of it in the calendar. Yeah. That's mm. fascinating. That, that's holistic sort of beyond the bounds of the text itself. It's, it's reaching out arms outside the text and dragging in real world elements to its meaning. It's really lovely. There's a bunch of great stuff like that in Doctor Who. It's nice that people around the show and kind of working with the show kind of cared about it enough to do stuff like shuffle things and like put demons on Remembrance Sunday and stuff even if you know the the, the showrunner didn't necessarily care about giving it main characters <laughs> like that, that sort of thing. It's nice that someone was there putting out the effort putting the effort in. Yeah. Is there a clear actual order that the series was written in? Yes we do know more about that. There was a making of series 11 little additional magazine with 
uh, Doctor Who magazine 539 a few years ago. And it doesn't go into the ordering of the first five series 11 episodes. So I'm presuming they were always meant as the same, like Rosa would always be the first historical in the third episode. There's nothing said to the contrary of that anyway. But the back half of the series, it does talk about how that was, it was different the time they were filming the actual episodes in terms of the order. So Demons was originally scripted as episode nine. Kablam was thought of as episode eight. When they were filming it, they were calling it episode eight. And Witchfinders, when they were filming it, they were calling it episode six. So it sounds like the series 11 order was initially thought of as the first five the same. And then episode six, Witchfinders. Episode seven, it has to be, it takes you away. Episode eight, Kablam. Episode nine, Demons. And episode 10, of course, Ranscore. Uh, so that's a really interesting, different back half. Uh, Rosa would still be the first historical, at least going by this magazine. But it makes you think if even more things were switched around, I wonder what it would have been like. Um, as Streven said, you don't have to watch it in order, uh, like Gig mentioned. So it's interesting to think of different orders. But the back half being so different at time of filming is super interesting. Yeah, I'm quite fascinated by that. Having the first step into history that the 13th Doctor does, being her laying out the rules of how time travel works and how you can never interfere, and then immediately interfering um, at the injustice of the witch trials, that that would be a really solid character choice if that was positioned in the place of Rosa, say. And Flux, um, something clearly went weird because the clapperboards don't sync up with the actual episode numbers. And John Bishop might have just misspoke, but him talking about the walk stuff being in episode one is weird because that's very much episode two. So I I think I, I, I something happened there as well. Yeah. My um, my friend who I mentioned is doing the flux edit has folded the two Sontaran invasions into one. And oh, that's cool. apparently you don't even notice that because it's the same thing twice, right? That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure anything exactly like that happened in the edit, but there's definitely stuff in Flux, um, and to a lesser extent, the other two series as well, where um, the pieces have been moved about really late in the game and create some odd implications. I wish we had more commentaries for it, because Bell and Vinda, I think, something about their placement of their subplot feels weird to me, because of the... Village of the Angels credits interruption is so weird mm -hmm. that, yeah, I think something went weird there. I remember Chris saying that of all the companions, I seem to have, like, a fine line in Graham. <laughs> For some reason, he was like my spirit animal. Was good like <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just thought that was interesting. Huh. I, th I assume it's... Off so that comes after, in the episode, that bit of commentary comes after the... The world just needs good men, and you are a good man, Prem. That scene. So, so was Chibnall saying to Vinay that Vinay was like in tune with Graham, or yes? Okay, <laughs> I, I guess. Well, you know. See, uh, what we were talking about in Tesla of um, it being relevant, what the characters' emotional states are at this point in the series. Again, it's not complicated stuff, but the fact that Graham's loss of Grace is relevant to. Th this wedding that's at risk of tearing a family apart. Obviously, those two things get connected because that's how writing works. <laughs> but it's as if that's a, a strange idea, a unique bit of insight that Vinay connects those threads together. And she was like, y you get Graham better than anyone. Considering that Graham it kind of gets a chance to be this, uh, I guess, wise mentor figure to one of the guest characters and kind of gets his scene off alone with them, talking to them, reassuring them. And he gets that in like episode six of his first series. And like, whereas, you know, and as we saw before, Yaz takes until partway through her second series to be trusted upon to, I don't know, have a talk, have a heart to heart or like be kind of off on her own in any context with one of the guest characters. I, I guess it really just shows the, the hierarchy, I suppose, but like of who's considered more interesting by just by the writers in general and who has more like material to work with. Well, I was just going to point out Vinay seemed to be the first to think of pairing Graham and Yaz alone for a scene, for a dialogue. Mm. That was another stroke of inspiration. And it's quite a... It's a meaty scene, you know, speaking relatively, uh, for the two characters. So that's, I guess, part of the Graham whispering. 
Yeah, Graham actually gets two, like, being wise and wise mentor scenes in this one episode. It's kind of interesting. Does that form part of a Hindu marriage ceremony? Yeah. That was, like, one of the tricky things. It's like, how do I make this very clear and very simple? Uh, good old rope. I'm not often lost. Multifaceted. Though, but I never thought this day would come. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's the rope and throughout that scene transformed from something that draws a border to something that mm, unites yes. people. It's beautiful. Yes, symbolism. The end of us. <laughs> symbolism. Symbolism. Yeah, it's, it's like... We had some of those moments of test as well. It's like it's good. It absolutely is good. But yeah, to be championing these basic things, it's a just indicative of the era. Yeah, his his reaction there, uh, like it's being pointed out, like it's this genius thing, and it's a really lovely element of the episode. But just going, yeah, it's symbolism. It's how writing works. Yeah, it's how you do it. Yeah, it's not much to say for that one. Like Vinay himself, there's not much to say there. Love that theme. That's the first time they've changed it ever. Wow. Ever? Yeah. Amazing. Wow. It would have f- felt very strange to go into there. Yeah. yeah, I did say this, this is one of the things to Chris. There's like a West Wing episode where I think they're talking about 9-11 and then they cut out to the jaunty, like, West Wing theme music and I just had that in mind. We talked to Chris and was like, surely that would be a bit weird. Yeah. And uh, I guess it was on his mind already because he was like, ah, I've got a solution for that. Yeah. There we go. Something is very wrong here at Kablan. If anything happens to us, or anyone else here, you'll have me to answer to. <laughs> Delivery for the, for the top. <laughs> <laughs> uh, second time ever, isn't it? What's the other one? Isn't it? Doesn't it happen in Rosa? Mm, that's not so much changing the theme as replacing the R- theme with yeah. a different like song altogether. Like I, I see, I see what you mean. Most different kind of thing, uh, which I guess is like the silent credits. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think it's again interesting, Vinay having this wider handle on the episode than like just a writer. Like he's he's thinking of the tonal control stuff again. He's he's like specifically saying to Chibnall, you know, I've seen another TV. Sometimes it doesn't really work to go into the credits theme as usual from an emotional ending. Have you considered changing it? And Chimnall apparently already had, but I think again it just speaks. It's a it. Uh, Vinay comes off very well here. Uh, he's really thinking in an encompassing way about his episode. Yeah, I miss that Chibnall who like cared about tonal control enough to do something like this. Like I missed him in series twelve when he was writing Nor's execution, and then be like, mm, actually, maybe this shouldn't go in. <laughs> and yeah, just be all over the place. Oh, the the village, the angels, mid credit scene, just unbelievable tonal whiplash. Or Dan in um, The Vanquisher, Santaran's killed all of his people. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, my pup? Oh no, genocide. <laughs> um, I really, I really appreciate writers um, who are just across things like that. Who um, obviously you don't want writers to overstep, but in TV, especially where there's so much more communication between writers and other elements of production. Um, it's, I, I love, especially in RTD and Moffat scripts, they always have little notes like, we could reuse this costume from this, or, uh, this would be the, this would be the barn as it appeared in Listen rather than the 50th. Little things like that. The, um, Colony Saf, uh, has notes in the script about how to make the segue work. <laughs> it's just fun little things like that. Sometimes people enter in with fan wisdom from film, and so they're like, hey, you know, it's actually bad script writing to, you know, be adding in those things. And it's like, I think that it's quite a different arena, uh, film writing to TV writing. The status of a writer is completely different in TV to film. So, yeah, it's like, like to look at Moffat's beautiful script for the pilot and the visual direction he's giving that and go, hey, that's bad, because I read on Reddit that you're not meant to put directions in scripts. Like, it's, it's nonsense. Yeah, exactly. I've... Mentioned before, I've heard a lot of audio commentaries. I'm a fan of them. It's one of the reasons we're doing this. Um, At one show where I listened to all the audio commentaries, there was one for every episode, and there were six seasons of the show, was Better Call Saul. There's a snippet from one of those commentaries about 44 minutes into season five, episode three, the guy for this. Uh, And this snippet is really, really super duper relevant to all the stuff we were just talking about. So let's take a listen to it. It's not 
spoilery at all in any way. We're not hearing any of the actual dialogue of the episode either. We're just listening to the commentary, which is about general script writing topics. But the context of what they're talking over is it, it's one of the main characters of the show driving somewhere. They change their mind, they turn around and they go somewhere else as they try to do something differently to how they did it earlier in the episode. The people we'll hear from uh, first up is the director of the episode, Michael Morris, then actor Dean Norris, actor Bob Odenkirk, and then the writer of the episode, Anne Cherkis. Let's listen in. It's a great scene of subtext. It's a very complicated little scene, this, without any dialogue to sort of, you know, s- s- explain, it, which is exactly what you don't want to see, is the dialogue that explains everything. But here, nothing is explained, and it's so interesting. that she, she really feels she's at a moment she has to do something. I always loved the scripts of Breaking Bad and at the end of the same over Better Call Saul where the, you know, the prose in between the, uh, the dialogue was, that, was so descriptive. Uh-huh. People never, you know, I think it maybe came through and we, we were always given great direction for those scenes where you don't say anything via yeah. the script, you know. And, well, uh, Dean, it's like, a, it's like a rule of screenplay writing, an old rule not to do that. And I think it's right. I think that's insane because right. I love that. So I'm like you, I, I right from the first time I saw that in Breaking Bad, where the script tells me the actor, this is what the character's thinking about. Right. This right. is maybe an, a sub, you know, a subtextual emotional yep. I loved hearing that. Yeah. And I love that everybody who reads the script sees that and that it tells the director to go ahead and stay with this. Per- you, you, we don't have a line here. Just get right. that emotion on camera. Yeah. I don't know why that rule is so stupid. And, I, and I've told so many writers since then, uh, you know, to do that, to, to just write that shit in and. And because you know what it is, if you're writing, and Anne, you could speak to this, Mm -hmm. you know, if you don't have that to rely on, if you don't, if you feel like your screenplay 101 teacher ordered you never to write subtext, that you then write dialogue. You you start to write this fucking words that are not as good. Well, yeah, because you get, it becomes very, it it becomes expositional. And, uh... And that that isn't that's no fun um, for the actor or I think the audience. Yeah, gig, especially like with acting experience. How do you think that um, Better Call Saul commentary, uh, season five, episode three? How do you think that little snippet uh, plays with the stuff we've been talking about? You know, I think um, to get scripts like that with a wealth of um, detail and um, vision and uh, description and stuff like that. I think um, I suppose it depends on what kind of production you're in. If you're in a very writer-led, script-led drama, you know, like Better Call Saul or whatever, and you're a director or an actor, getting stuff like that, it's it's so good, right? Whereas, I think maybe in some other industries, it might be awkward if you're getting such prescriptiveness from the writer when it's going to be more of a director-led thing. I, I don't know. But um, I think generally... On the whole, it's definitely not inherently a bad thing to do in a script in any way. I mean, in all kinds of visual mediums, you'll get script processes that have huge amounts of uh, like detail and description. I mean, if you look at like Alan Moore's comic scripts, for example, you'll see there's just a wall of text for every panel, right? And stuff like that. You know, it applies to TV as well. I think it's just um, the really interesting detail in that uh, commentary clip. It's how they mention where if a writer doesn't let themselves do anything like that, they might risk trying to put it into the dialogue and having the characters talk in a way that's that's devoid of subtext. And that's really interesting. I think um Yeah. And I think generally that that may be more a case of writers who aren't very disciplined about it. Because I think you can probably you can probably have it both ways. Like you can write in a very elliptical manner and also write subtextual dialogue. But I think if you're maybe not so good at that, then it might be something you find yourself inadvertently doing, putting the description into the words and having it come out really sloppily and chunkily. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like the 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 kind of script that is going to be um, best suited is dependent on what the production is and what kind of show it is and who the practitioners involved are. So it's going to be um, to, to each their own. But it's definitely, it's not something that should never be done in any way. It's something that can definitely have a lot of uh, positive impact. Yeah, I think much to the frustration to the people that would like one size fits all rules for you know everything and certainly for storytelling and for drama, it, it, it never is. Not even in 
you know, scripted television drama, which Doctor Who is and Better Call Saul is that it's, it's going to be different for each production and for different actors. Like not every leading actor is going to be like Bob Odenkirk and think this is awesome. You know, give me everything you can, you know, prescribe away. And, you know, he still has his own input absolutely on the show, but you know, I'm sure some actors would get a bit shirtier about that. There's just no one size fits all rules for any of this, which means that you can't, you know, kind of have the axiom of you're not allowed to put that into your writing it, because, well, you know, sometimes it will work, sometimes it won't, sometimes people will want it, sometimes people won't want it. But with what they're saying there, the kind of tension between you can put a lot of stuff into like the stage directions and little bits explaining the character in the script and not not in the dialogue for the actor to say, but just in the script that the audience don't literally see. Or you might channel that into the dialogue itself and start putting the character explaining stuff in dialogue and then you're overbearing the actors. Uh, how do you think that interfaces with like these Chibnall era script things? Because they, is it really doing either? Like when we talk about the uh, prescriptive, so sad, so tragic, so epic, so emotional stuff, it kind of feels like a third thing to me. What would you say to that? Yeah, it's definitely I, I don't recall any instances in chib scripts where he does the big block of descriptive text or anything like that it really is all in in the sense um the scripts if i had to try and characterize the way he's writing them in terms of these terms it's less so much overly descriptive as it is just i'd say it's thin on all sides like it's thin in terms of the directions being given and it's also thin in terms of the words being given to speak as well and you just get this little these skeletal um uh, I guess almost micromanaging little details of so sad, but not actually a huge amount in terms of subtext or, uh, you know, detail or things going on. I guess it's like you say that so sad isn't really that helpful for an actor. It's just saying <laughs> that's the direction to go in and, you know, do it. But these better call Saul scripts like this might still be prescriptive and kind of telling an actor what's what, but it's not saying so sad. It'll have, you know, a bit explaining why this character feels that way. And then the actor could channel that, you know, they're going to be sad, but there are a couple of different ways they could play it, which I assume is actually could be helpful, whereas just so sad is just kind of <laughs> li limiting. Yeah, I feel often with the so sad things, it's stuff that will really be obvious even if you took it out. So even if you didn't put so sad atop a line, generally the context of the scene would indicate whether this line is going to be a particularly you know heartbroken one or a particularly pleading or devastated or angry one you know g generally conversations sort of um suggest what's going on there and when you have to give a bit of guidance like a thing in brackets it's going to be for something that's maybe wouldn't necessarily be obvious but that you want a specific a special um like spin on or something like that so i guess with chib it's almost like maybe he doesn't quite trust the reader of the script or the people involved to like follow along with every last thing that's in his head so he's just putting it all down rather than necessarily sort of having much faith in the cl clarity of what he is actually writing but i mean that that is just presumption on my part yeah it's it's like they were saying in that clip how that anxiety over whether you, you're getting something through in a script enough can re, can lead to you overloading the dialogue with it as a script writer. But with Chibnall, like while he does have <laughs> overloaded dialogue sometime, like we've talked about uh, like the insanity of uh, Sasha's monologues in The Timeless Children and he, so much so that the actor, you know, <laughs> was having issues with how all that was going. Like he certainly overloads his dialogue sometimes, but I guess maybe the impulse to, oh, I haven't explained this enough, gets channeled into the so sad things. Like that's his way of making sure everyone knows what's what, even though like you say, you'd think that the dialogue would speak for its own. It's like some of my, uh, I, something I really love with novels is those novels that drop a lot of punctuation, like, like Cormac McCarthy novels where they, mm -hmm. he, he doesn't use most punctuation because he figures if I'm writing the characters well enough, you're going to know who's speaking on every line because it's, it's going to be obvious because the dialogue will be unique enough. I, I, I love that. I find that it's decluttering and, it, and it, it can only work if you're a good enough writer to have such characterful, you know, writing instincts and <laughs> not, not so much in these in this era of Doctor Who, I guess. But I think another element with Chibnall is also that in terms of, um, well, there may not be that much in the script to actually convey in the first place, which is why you get the essential shallowness of directions like so sad or, <laughs> you know, beat, beat, beat. You know. uh, I, so it, I think it's just all the problems are connected to each other. You know, you can't really take one out of the and look at it on its own. Oliver, what's your perspective with 
writing stuff like this sort of thing, the would be over explanations like the stage directions or the emotional explanations or just things that, you know, some people might tell you, you're not meant to put that in a script, a script is meant to leave everything to the actors or whatever. What's your perspective on all this sort of stuff? It, it's, uh, I, uh, I write things to actually be made by people. And if you don't put stuff in the script to make it clear how things are possible or um, little notes to how things can be made, then people um, struggle to see the practical side of it. If you write with clear practical thought in mind, then it all holds together better for actually being produced, which I think is the thing. When you're writing for film, you write a script. The script is its own thing, and then somebody makes that into a film someplace down the line. If you're writing for TV, you're writing for it to be made this week, right? It's scheduled them, yeah. It's like in the film, the director has all the control because they they have the time, you know, to make it. In in, in TV, the directors have to... You've, I've, you've seen, like, Tala talk about when she does some of her superhero stuff, like, she had some shots she thought would be cool. She just couldn't do them because you don't have the time in TV. Everything is so regimented because it's, it's it's such a monster of how the productions are made. It's just a completely different art form. Uh, on the script writing note, it's interesting because here we're kind of praising um, some of the extra thought put into scripts by other people. Yet I know a lot of us sometimes poke some fun at things Chibnall does in his scripts. What do you think is the difference between the stage directions that might be in a Moffat script or something or the, the production ideas that might be in an RTD writer's script and what Chibnall does in his scripts? Can either of you guys speak to that? I think it's, um, I guess it's a matter of specificity because whereas Moffat would say, okay, we can make this, we can reuse that, we can do this. Chibnall will go, brackets, so iconic, <laughs> close brackets, or, you know, beat, 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 beat. I guess it's it's... It's like both being specific and also like not specific. Like it's that lack of, um, I guess it's not like, it's sort of like Chib is beaming, trying to beam this kind of vague idea from his head, but not being that practical in terms of it being stuff that's actually useful. Yeah, the specificity is exactly it. Where if you, if you want a scene to be iconic, if you want a particular shot, you describe the Doctor stepping through a projection of David Tennant's face and going basically run. You say that that happens because that's how script writing works. You say the thing that happens on the screen and the fact that it's iconic is A, in the content of what it is and B, in the style in which you write what it is. You don't go, and this is iconic. <laughs> and, 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 you know, there's no hard rules in writing and in... um in TV writing in particular, sometimes it is just useful to go, this shot is important, make sure this shot is iconic. But as a general rule, you should be making shots that are iconic in the content of what's happening on the screen rather than just saying that this shot should be iconic. Yeah, stuff should be iconic on its own merits. You can't just like, oh, th th this should be good. <laughs> like, you know, it, it should, the goodness should come out from what it is. In Chibnall scripts, a lot of the time it's just the doctor pulls a face, iconic. But the actual iconic moments of the show are like an astronaut stepping out of a Utah lake. It doesn't say this should be iconic, but you've made an iconic thing. <laughs> You've you've used your imagination to come up with imagery that's going to sustain, uh, and, and that's what makes it iconic, not the fact that you've said it should be iconic. In the pilot, Moffat talks about that kind of cinema-style montage, like he specifically talks about the visual of it. He doesn't say iconic montage. Uh, it brings to mind the scene in Heaven Sent, um, the window jumping out scene, where the Doctor's describing where the veil yard's been plucked from. No. The veil. Where the veil's been plucked from. Different thing. Veil yard. <laughs> Different Doctor who -y thing. Uh, where the veil's been plucked from in his nightmares. Um, and uh, he, he goes, uh, once upon a time, there was an old lady and she died, right? That That's not scripted, anything like that. There's um, one of the great behind-the-scenes interviews um, is Talele talking about how they were doing that scene somber um, the Doctor recalling this nightmare from his childhood, um, and they gave it a few goes, and uh, Talele and Peter had a chat, and were like, hey, this isn't quite working. Do we want to do a completely different spin on it? And so Peter puts it into this totally different energy. He adds the pop, um, 
and then it's suddenly, you know, it's peppy and fun and the Doctor's clearly um, sort of shrugging off the weight of the situation and it's it brings a different energy to the scene. And you can do that when you have a script that isn't micromanaging the exact emotions of the scene. It lets the director and it lets the actor properly flex what they know. Um, and even on a subtler scale, uh, I was reading the Doctor Fool script a couple of days ago because it's fantastic. Yeah, the the speech, the big speech, the the just kind speech, um, is fairly uh, micromanaged as far as things go. There's an emphasis on certain lines, and the the doctor's exact emotion is shifted, and lots of things change between that script and the screen. Um, I'm thinking specifically of uh, in in the script, the doctor shouts that both of the masters need to stop and turn around and talk to him and the sheer power of his voice and the emotion and it stops them. But in the actual episode, he has to physically get in their way. So there, there's slight emphasis changes between the script and the script. But the really significant one is um, is that, that pause that Peter adds in where he goes, um, where I stand, and just leaves it for a second, just lets it hang. Th- that emphasis... It comes from you can you can even add that in a in a scene that's quite rigidly written with specific emotions in in place. An actor can inject emphasis where it matters, and so I think it's the fact that these scenes in Chibnall scripts are so over directed um, is obviously a him issue. But you would also hope that directors and writers would find room to express their personal uh, emphasis within that script like Peter does in that scene. And that heaven sent example you brought up is really good because I think it's a perfect example of how like by playing the scene in a way which was not necessarily obvious, so the Doctor gives a monologue to a scary monster about nightmares but he does it in a way that's kind of like frenetic and kind of excitable and kind of even a bit kind of funny, but that brings out the subtext which is that you know he is shitting himself, you know he's panicking and this is what he does to, to cope with that, so the fact that the the it becomes subtext and when you have a Chibnall script, you know, subtext is maybe not that much of a thing and maybe there's not that much of it to actually work with <laughs> when you have like so sad like there's I mean obviously you could still you could still work with it and make it more interesting by trying to kind of like layer it and do different things with it but at the same time it, it's a question of how much is there to actually work with in the first place like with a Moffat script obviously you're going to have tons and tons I think the other in- big thing we talk about in his scripts are how often he'll specify beat and how often he'll specify in parentheses so adjective often so sad uh, and I think it's a similar thing there. He does it so much that it kind of becomes meaningless and he's not really specifying why. Like, if he wrote a speech for the Doctor uh, that was sad, that would be obvious in the speech and then Jody could do that how she wants. But to write a speech and then, you know, keep breaking into beat and so sad, uh, maybe you guys will disagree. You both have more experience in industries related to this than me, but I feel like it's almost a kind of insecurity on his part to have to keep specifying this is sad, this is sad. Like, is, is it not obvious in the writing himself? And so, if you're specifying so much that this is so sad, what does it mean to ever specify that? Like, I feel like if your script only has a few specifications of this is so adjective, it kind of carries more weight because then it's more of a directed thing because that's not how the script is usually done. Or like when you specify a beat, if you don't often do that, it's like more of a direction to the actor there that, oh, this isn't like normal. But when you're like just constantly almost like micromanaging the beats, it comes across to me that either the actor is going to not pay much mind to it at all, or they're going to like be micromanaged by what you're doing. Uh, Gig, what do you think of, of that kind of thing for actors? Um, well, I would say having done like a lot of theatre, you find that for a lot of playwrights, it's like the complete inverse. Like they, they, they don't do the so sad, so iconic, so blah, blah, blah shit at all. Like, and for a lot of the times they do, they give you so much freedom that actually the actors and the director and production team have to kind of like work overtime, try and like decide what they're going to do with it, how they're going to play each specific line. And because, and because obviously with a lot of it, with when you've got something that's built through rehearsal like you know theater for example you know a lot of that is finding what you're going to do through the process of making it and stuff whereas with tv you know you kind of need to know what, you, what you're going to do because you need to get in get shooting it get it done you've got a tight schedule all that stuff um so like it, it makes a degree of sense but at the same at the same time it's just like 
I mean, how much can an actor really get from so sad? <laughs> like, you know, it's it's not really, it, it's really not giving you very much like to to, to work with. It's just, it's just vague, you know. It, and it, it's not really. I think in terms of an actor and like helping them like work out how they should play something. I think if you're gonna give them like direction and advice like that, I think you can be you can be more interesting and helpful if you're going to bother doing it at all. I don't think just telling them so sad or like so so defeated or whatever, like, you know, what, what does that really do? What does that achieve? You might be interested when we get to War of the Sontarans, the director's going to talk about going off script a bit. I mean, that's, uh, again, that's in, Demons gives so much room for that subtext and the the meaning of the scenes to breathe and there's a lot in the direction i think it's a genuinely gorgeous episode uh, i think then really works with all the elements of production and leaves room doesn't overwrite it we're still talking about demons technically aren't we yeah no i Vinay, whenever he whenever he eventually gets to show on a show or something i think he's going to do amazing amazing work it's such a shame he was kind of hamstrung with a law heavy co-authorship in series 12 because i think he he's a really good writer i'm I'm happy to follow him for sure yeah we three all like vinay's writing it seems as far as i can see uh, from the vantage point of very early january 2023 vinay's next project seems to be being part of a netflix remake of the 2009 novel one day and that's what variety reports his own website doesn't currently credit any tv work past fugitive of the jadoon very unfortunately it does list two untitled 2022 films uh, one with film four and one with working title pictures i know he adapted chekhov's the cherry orchard story into a sci-fi space setting for the theater in 2022 and his website still lists that as an untitled 2022 commission so maybe he's got more in the works and that page just isn't fully up to date i hope so anyway he's great I hope he does more on TV and in film uh, sometime soon. I would really love to see that. He made some interesting blog posts back in 2020 around Fugitive of the Jadoon's airing. He had one before its airing and one after its airing. Do you remember what I'm talking about here? The, the one where he's like working with Chris has been yeah fascinating. It's been an interesting time. Yeah, um, these short uh, Patelegrams post, I think they're called. Um, I think he was kind of evasive in those posts. I think he talked in a broadly um, pos- fairly positive sense, but I think maybe there was some subtext in those posts about his experience on the show that if you wanted to, you could maybe read into. I think it was, um, it's maybe not the kind of unqualifiedly effusive uh, remarks that you might expect of someone whose episode had just come out. Yeah, especially because as we just listened to the Demon's commentary, he, sound, he sounded pretty happy with a lot of what he achieved there, but his tone is quite different here, at least as I'm seeing it. I'll, I'll read out some of the relevant bits from these telegrams. So in the one that came out before Fugitive of the Dead, which is numbered 47, one of the sections in the newsletter is, is that a rhino in your pants or are you just pleased to see me? Today, my second episode of Doctor Who was released. I won't say too much about it, but it's always nice to have your work go out, especially as this year has been a bit tricky. The process for this episode was completely different than with my first, as is the episode itself. There are jokes in this one for a start. Even if many of my faves ended up getting cut, oh, the eternal dance of writing for strict time slots. It was co-written with Chris, the showrunner, which was a fascinating experience since I've never actually written with someone else before. Directed by Nita Manzor, an old friend and genuine superstar. Keep an eye on her, she's brilliant, and it was fun being able to write what I could suit, what I knew to be her strengths and interests. At the end of my work on Who this time around, I felt more certain than ever that I do now need to strike out, focus more fully on my own TV ideas, and step up to being the boss as much as you can be in telly anyway. Nevertheless, I've learned a great deal from both of the seasons I've been on the show, and if I ever do return one day, I hope I get to do a proper big sci-fi story. I feel this all the more now that I'm progressing more deeply and with greater confidence into my original sci-fi show. To be honest, I'm really pumped up about it. Yesterday, I went into a notes meeting feeling excited and came away more so rare. This morning, I woke up with a head full of ideas, all of a decent quality, even rarer. In fact, this almost never happens, so cherish those moments when you get them. But it's a sign that I'm 
in a good part of the process. Stuff is clicking to the point that the ideas are starting to self-generate, which means you've got something right in the alchemy. So yeah, I think this could and should be something really decent, entertaining, tonally rich, and speaks to all of the things I care about. What more could you ask from for your work? <laughs> the phrasing of that just gave me an intrusive thought. Do you remember in 2018, Doctor Who magazine, speaking about demons? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Chibnall had a little bit talking about um, big emotions. What more could you want from television? Yeah, and vistas, I think you mentioned there as well. Yeah. yeah. I think um, my favourite quip from that Vinay blog is when he talked about writing it with Chris Chibnall. He said it was a fascinating experience. <laughs> Very interesting choice of words there. He sounds so dour, and then he starts talking about his own show, and you can feel the energy like rush back into him. It, mm. Yeah, he lights up. At the end of his work on that episode, he feels more certain than ever that he needs to strike out on his own. Yeah, he needs to be the boss, like like his own boss. He's like he is something. Somehow through this process, he's become sick of having like some other person sort of bossing everything. I guess. Yeah, I hope I'm not overinterpreting him. I'm just it's. I think he's a great writer, an interesting guy, and I think that was a really interesting blog post. I mean, we're we're big supporters of uh, Vinay's writing here. Yeah, well, we'll we'll keep on happily following his writing. Uh, and I guess on that note, he also had a blog newsletter thing come out after Fugitive Aired, which is numbered forty eight and titled Aftermath of the Jadoon from January thirty. <laughs> and this one reads, "Hi, folks." Well, certainly there was no better time to be off Twitter than this last week. When I go back, I look forward to picking through the notifications, but the intensity of reaction to Fugitive of the Jadoon reached me despite my attempts to stay away. I have to say that combined with the jet lag from my New Zealand trip, it spun me out a little and made this week a bit of a write-off. Apologies to everyone I owe work to. I tell myself every time it will be different, but I'm always wrong. Need to either get better at getting my head down or better at creating space around transmission dates. In fact, you're getting this newsletter early as an attempt by me to shake some anxiety and get back to work. I'm aware that there are some Doctor Who fans who subscribe to this newsletter, so I just want to say that if you liked it, then I'm delighted for you. If you didn't, that's alright, I absolutely understand. Hmm. That critique comes from a place of love for the show and differing taste. You'll never find a writer who's 100% happy with what they've done either. I'll probably dig into some of those Twitter slash video slash podcast explorations someday down the line when it's not so fresh and or I'm feeling masochistic. I'll probably agree with much of it. And finally, if you felt like it was, I don't know, symbolic of the culture wars and it made you so mad that you're wishing pain slash misery on people doing their jobs well... I'm thrilled you have a hobby that energizes you so completely. With just a little more effort, flapping hands can be turned into jumping jacks and you've got a solid foundation for an exercise routine. So in this case, I guess he, he seems um, more uh, anxiety stricken when it comes to like the transmission of his work. I would say the reaction to Fugitive was broadly, I'd say, a pretty positive one. Like the, just the general fan reaction. You've got Barrowman coming back. You've got epic Ruth reveals and stuff. So I feel um, generally, I guess it's maybe more just the just the intensity of people being so hyped and saying so much and being so uh, I don't know <laughs> over the top about it that he felt he needs to kind of hide away from so not necessarily a reflection on the episode or how he feels about it in this case in, in that little detail but the stuff later about how <laughs> he might dig into some of the critical uh, podcasts <laughs> and essays and blogs and shit and might find himself agreeing that that's quite interesting too he's a very he's very plugged in i remember back in the day he talked about reading one of those 10th doctor books new series adventures uh that was set in india or had some component in india mm. uh when he was writing demons and it's just there's honestly there's not a lot of tv writers i think that would do that that would go some definitely but to go borrow out you know david Tennant novels to you know <laughs> to see how they interact with what you're doing or what they might cast a light on he's he's very into it seems fan stuff and other you know, media stuff. It's 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 very endearing, I think, as a Doctor Who fan to see someone else so interested and kind of engaged. I mean, obviously, you don't have to be, of course, but it's it's very endearing. I think it's also um, 
a reflection of him taking it very seriously, just contributing to the show yeah. with st- such a huge uh, reputation behind it and such a wealth of stuff. Because obviously, even if you're writing Doctor Who, you don't actually need to borrow out novels and shit. I think most people who've written Doctor Who would agree with that. But I think he takes it that seriously coming into it that he went that far. And, you know, it's a sign of him being that respectful and being very, just taking his job seriously. You know, it's a good thing to, to do and to think about. Yeah. I guess it's up to listeners to decide how much him saying, if you don't like it, I absolutely understand, is just that endearing kind of connection with fandom or or if it relates to some of the weird undertones in his previous blog post, which sounded maybe dissatisfied. Hmm. It could be Rob Shearman style (laughs) self-deprecation. Yeah. Well, that's that's a good way to sum up, I think. Yeah, it is. Let's end on that note for now. Uh, Next time, we'll look at Rosa and Spyfall Part 1, concentrating particularly on ideology and authorship and worldviews, continuing to very much build off themes and topics and conversations started and established in this Tesla Demons commentary exploration, as well as definitely the Spyfall Part 2 controversy and writing inspiration one as well. And of course, elements from the finality and actor audience commentary exploration over the last three specials of the era hang over everything but the next one very much builds off this one and the spyfall 2 one the rosa commentary yeah it's particularly interesting for now please chime away with your thoughts on these two commentaries and our discussions of them things we said things we might not have said or things the commentators did or didn't say comment away with your thoughts uh, stacking comments on comments on comments you're commenting on our commentary on the commentaries so please chime away with that your thoughts and reactions anything you've got to say we always like looking at and interacting with the comments and we'll see you next commentary discussion thank you again for listening